have with us today for our next uh, seminar, uh, Mr. Paul Walter, who is the director of the Sauk County Historical Society. And as our uh, information says, he'll be giving us a uh, presentation on the society's recent acquisition of the Chicago Northwestern Depot and division headquarters here in Baraboo, and the plans for its restoration. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, pleasure to be here. Um, uh, you're to be commended on the growth of your organization. We started 101 years before you, and it took us 32 years before we had our first building of our own, so kudos to you guys. Um, I'll sit down, because I, I gotta run the computer here, but and you can look at the pictures instead of me. But uh, there it is, the building that you should all know, if just a block away from uh, Lake States here in town, of course. Just a quick, uh, uh, history of Baraboo and why the railroad is even here at all. Of course, Baraboo was started because of the river, uh, the modern settlement that is. People have been living on the river here for a couple thousand years, as evidenced by the mounds in the area. But uh, the river drops 45 feet from one side of town to the other, so eventually there were uh, four dams along the Baraboo River within, within the city and provided a tremendous amount of um, water power. This, this uh, bird's eye drawing of Baraboo is very interesting because it was done in 1870, so it shows us a snapshot of Baraboo the year before the railroad arrived and how it was kind of, its growth was kind of stymied until uh, the railroad came. This was the extent of its uh, growth uh, being hemmed in with the, the bluffs. And uh, here's a close-up of the center of town. Uh, the railroad depot would eventually be on Lynn Street there at the bottom. And you can see the large, uh, almost four-story mill there on the river at the Oak Street Dam. That was the largest grist mill in the county. Eventually had 10 run of stone, uh, producing something like 25,000 barrels of flour a year. And that all had to be taken by wagon, either over the bluffs to Sauk Prairie, uh, to the river, or up to the Dells to get on the train there. So there was a tremendous need for a railroad. Here's another shot from 1866 looking at that same mill in the background and the only bridge across the Baraboo River at Ash and Walnut, all within the Lake States uh, neighborhood there. Actually, that picture is about from where Lake States sits today. Um, so finally, in the uh, 1870s, uh, the railroad came. There had been uh, attempts, of course, all through the 1840s, 50s, 60s, whenever. Uh, there were uh, attempts were thwarted by financial panics, land grant failures, but most importantly, the uh, topography of the area. And of course, uh, Baraboo, known as the Gem City, it's it's in this setting of the Baraboo Hills. We like to call the quartzite canoe, canoe-shaped uh, ring of uh, hard quartzite bluffs, and that uh, created quite a impasse for the railroads until there could be enough um, income to. to Breakthrough. So Sauk County was uh, connected to the railroad at the bottom uh, at Spring Green very early on in the 1850s, and also just outside of Sauk County at the top right uh, through the through the Dells or Kilbourne. But anything from the interior of the county had to be uh, transported from or to those locations. So it was quite a quite a feat to bring the railroad through in the 38 mile stretch from Madison to Baraboo. More than two million cubic yards of material had to be moved. This was more than all the material moved on the 242 mile stretch from Chicago to Green Bay. But eventually, the first train reached um, Baraboo uh, via the Devil's Lake Gap. Uh, so there's a the single track there, eventually double tracked. Um, first train arrived September 12, 1871. Over 10,000 people were on hand, which was about five times the population of this, the village at the time. Festivities were two and a half hours long. This, this has been labeled a picture of the first train to enter Baraboo Auger. It's the St. Clair, and the paper lists the, the locomotive as the St. Lawrence. So it was probably similar, but uh, apparently not the very first one. So that uh, made Baraboo part of the Chicago Northwestern network, which you could tell me a lot more about than I can tell you about, but uh, became part of this vast upper Midwest network of uh, railroads. Now, not only was Baraboo blessed to be on a railroad, we had a little depot built, um, we were also chosen to be the division headquarters for the Madison Division of Chicago Northwestern. So this was the original division office building 
which was uh, just on that vacant lot next to Lake States Railway Historical Association. And uh, besides that, the railroad also built an eating house and a hotel right along the tracks. I don't know if anybody got any sleep, but uh, that was their problem. Um, and you notice on the depot, there was no canopy. So this, this canopy here, which is right next to the depot, would be to the left, um, served uh, for passengers as well. So becoming a division headquarters meant we needed facilities. So an eight stall roundhouse was built originally uh, in 1872. Eventually that was expanded to 28 stalls. And there's a picture of the roundhouse in its glory. Um, actually, the Lake States building today would be just to the left of this photo. Uh, you can see St. Joe's Church there in the background on the other side of the river. And uh, we were fortunate enough to have another bird's eye drawing done in 1886. So you can see the growth of the town. The town population went from 2,758 in 1870 to 4,594 just nine years later, an increase of uh, 60 percent in 10 years. Um, and of course, this time the uh, bird's eye drawing includes the railroad um, front and center at the bottom with that uh, roundhouse. And at the very upper left, you can see uh, the railroad office just to the left of that, the eating house, and then just to the left of that, the one story uh, depot. So, of course, the line was extremely successful. Uh, the line was double tracked from 1896 through 1899, and here's the double track at Devil's Lake. But it took a while before the depot was upgraded, so you can see all the people lining up there in this miserable little depot. It really became quite a uh, disgrace or an embarrassment to Baraboo. Uh, in 1880, there were 100 employees bringing home an estimated 5,000 in wages each month. In 1892, the Baraboo Republic reported that about 500 railroad men and officers live here, and the payroll amounts to fully $30,000 per month. Don Evenson, I believe, is the one that went through the 1903 city uh, directory and pulled out all of the railroad employees by name and uh, position. And we had that list, and then I had a volunteer go through and color code the city map, the current city map, by parcel with where these people live. We wanted to see if the, if the engineers all lived in one section. I live in an engineer's house on 2nd Avenue from 1902. So it, did sh it showed some clustering. The green are um, railroad engineers, and uh, red are firemen, brown are brakemen, things like that. But you can just see that literally in every block of the city virtually at the time, uh, there was a railroad employee. So in the 1903 directory, Don was able to find 392 railroad employees, 97 engineers alone, 77 brakemen, 52 conductors, 50 firemen, 41 machinists, and others. And again, that estimated monthly payroll was 50,000. 1905 state census shows that 13% of the workforce in Baraboo is employed by the railroad. So here's a, here's a, a Picture from, I think, the Sauk County Democrat, one of Baraboo's three papers at the time, uh, constantly needling the railroad about the disgrace that the current uh, depot is. So finally, prayers and petitions were, were heard uh, in late 1901. And here, just a, a rare photograph of the people lined up. The depot's just on the extreme left, about halfway back, and then the rear, you can see the two-story uh, eating house, but uh, you can see the miserable conditions for uh, passengers. So finally, in the fall of uh, 1901, the news broke in all three Baraboo papers that uh, Chicago Northwestern would build a new uh, depot and general railroad offices. And fortunately for us, they reprinted the elevations front and back. These are the only place that we know of that they exist right now. So there's the uh, track side with the um, canopy kind of truncated for space because it was quite a bit longer than that. And oh, there we go, that's the south side and the north side, which this is, we have no photographs of the north side of the building uh, yet. We hope to get some, um, but this is the closest thing we've got, thankfully, in the 1901 paper. The building was uh, designed by Frost and Granger, uh, brother-in-laws. Uh, Frost and Granger, conveniently, were both married to daughters of the Chicago Northwestern president. 
Um, so that meant they were uh, job secure. They designed scores and scores of depots across uh, the country. Uh, they founded the firm in 1898. And one of the buildings that's uh, most similar to um, Baraboo is the Green Bay Chicago Northwestern Depot built in 1898. It was two stories. You can see the, the right portion of the two story is a little different color in brick. That was added a little bit later, but it was two stories uh, for a lot of the building. And note the tower there that uh, has some design similarities to um, Baraboo. So we've got a couple of arches there with a central pillar and an overarch around the top, and that's very reminiscent of the front facade of our building on the second floor. Uh, we acquired the building in uh, just about a year ago, October 23rd of last year. Another building that's similar, which we went down to look at, was the Racine Depot. This was built the year before Baraboo 1901. Uh, different architectural style, but it gives us hope and a few details of the, can the missing canopy. This had two canopies, one on the, the depot side and one across the tracks with a tunnel under the tracks to get uh, to the other side. It's been largely restored except uh, for painting of this side with the canopy. The other side has been completely repainted and gives a sense of what the Baraboo uh, canopy once uh, looked like. And the inside is uh, a different style and just has one waiting room, but again, gives us some inspiration for what could be at uh, Baraboo. So there's lots of uh, other Frost and Granger depots to look at, also uh, plans, uh, including the ones at Lake States. Fortunately for us, uh, there is existing uh, still the first floor plan. I think we got this from Lake States, who apparently got it from Chicago Northwestern Archives, maybe. Uh, so that's been helpful in, in uh, determining how the building was used. So if we look at the East end, we have two waiting rooms, men's and women's waiting rooms, separated by the passage and the ticket office, and then bathroom facilities for both. And then the single staircase that went to the upper floor to the division offices with, with one door to the outside. So as many as, I don't know, 40, 60 people up there, and there was one staircase to get out and in with no connection to uh, the interior of the building. All of the entrances virtually to the building are on the track side and to get from uh, the women's waiting room or the men's waiting room to the lunchroom you had to go outside and in a separate door. So next to the men's waiting room was the lunchroom uh, with a U-shaped counter there and about 19 stools and a kitchen in the back. We believe this was used maybe through about World War I period. We're not finding any references to it uh, much after World War I. Um, and old timers, 100 year old people remember looking through the windows and seeing a hand car stored in there, if you can believe it. So uh, it was not used uh, for very long. And then the baggage and express rooms on the uh, west end there. This is not the Baraboo Depot, but about the only picture I could find of a railroad lunchroom that was uh, similar. So we got some idea of what that looked like. Would have been Baraboo's first uh, fast food restaurant. So here's a picture of the uh, depot in its entirety with that 300-foot uh, uh, canopy along the track side. And again, that served as the hallway to get into the building because all the entrances were under the canopy. And of course, Baraboo would have just had a, one, a much smaller one-story depot, but we were the division headquarters, so the second floor contained offices for the division superintendent, assistant superintendent, chief dispatcher, dispatchers, roadmaster, superintendent of building and bridges, accountant, records, telegraph linemen, train master, telegraph operators, and clerks. Now, oddly enough, we have no pictures of the first floor of the building, but we have three pictures, uh, we believe, of the second story of the building. I think some of these came from Lake States, so thank you for that. Uh, this is the east end of the building, which was the clerk's uh, office. And this was one of the accounts. This we know who this is. Actually, this is Art Kruger, uh, who still has descendants here in town. And the, the reflection in the transom window above the door tells us exactly where this was upstairs, because those are only four windows with an arch like that uh, right in the middle of the second floor. And besides the flooring, everything in this picture is gone. Not a stick of woodwork, not a stick of plaster, uh, just a little bit of the flooring. 
This, this puzzled us for a while, but we believe this is the west end of the building, uh, which was a large room. It was originally a conductor's and engineer's um, kind of lounge room. Uh, we think maybe it had been uh, converted to a uh, telephone area. In 1908, telephone was added to the building for um, dispatching. And um, not only was, was telephone added, Baraboo became something of a central telephone hub for the division. So calls were patched through to other parts uh, here at uh, Baraboo. And if you look closely, the guy is wearing headphones and a, and a mouthpiece that's attached that he can talk into. So if anybody knows anything more about this, I'm all ears because I have uh, no idea. Um, no, you saw the spittoons on the earlier clerk's office photo in here as well, so keeping the boys happy. So could that be the uh, dispatcher's office? Because that big sheet on the table looks like a train sheet. Right, it could, yeah, could be. We. <laughs> There is a, this is, this would be at the west end of the building, so the big two-story bay window is much further down by the stairs, so I'm not sure how, um, well, if this got... You wouldn't necessarily have to see true, it, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah, so this could be uh, dispatch. And it yes, certainly it was. It, it was, it, yeah. It, it, it was. Okay. Uh, uh, Hotel is uh, that fellow. Oh, okay. And That's Francis. John, John Diesel. Okay, Francis is dead, probably. That's okay. Correct. Yep. All right, good. Yeah, he was a uh, train dispatcher at that time. Oh, good. Okay, perfect. I think the large piece in the background must be the telephone kind of exchange, maybe, where they're plugging in. I don't know what that is back there, but. Isn't that the box we found in the basement? No, that's still in the basement, and it's, it's quite a bit smaller than that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we'll talk. Ron, <laughs> done. <laughs> Uh, so, the, of course, the railroad uh, depot was the, the hub of the community. Um, love to know what event this is. Is this World War I soldiers coming home or, or whatnot? But um, it was, of course, where soldiers departed uh, from all conflicts from World War I to the Korean War. Uh, President Hoover made a whistle stop speech at the depot in 1932. And here's just a couple shots from the second floor of Ringling Brothers uh, horses and wagons uh, heading to or from uh, the winter quarters and the uh, railroad yard beyond the depot to the east. And then looking the other way, you can see a rare shot of the slate-covered canopy roof, as well as um, horses being unloaded where, where the viaduct is today, but it didn't exist at this point uh, west of the depot. So, uh, the depot um, had its heyday from about 1902 to 1933. The division offices were moved to Madison in 33, so the upstairs was largely unused after that, as far as we know. Eventually, just the men's waiting room was used, the lunchroom was closed, so it kind of uh, declined in use to just select areas. And we go from that photo to uh, this one, one of the um, later photos of a modern, uh, more modern uh, train engine. The depot was uh, last used in uh, the summer of 1963 when it was uh, passenger service ended here in Baraboo and it was sold and uh, the canopy was removed. Actually, the picture in the paper with the last train pulling out, the, the canopy is already being dismantled and uh, the vast majority of it was moved to Circus World where it still exists today and we would like to get it back. <laughs> uh, but this is a rare shot uh, after the canopy was removed, and we can see some details of the doors and windows on that track side, which would otherwise be uh, in invisible. Eventually, the uh, building, as you can see, was great for the kids to shoot out uh, the second floor windows. I won't name any names in here, not that I know any of them. Uh, sure, it became uh, quite a quite a nuisance. Um, it was eventually turned into a warehouse, so every single window and door was uh, bricked up with concrete block, as it exists today. Um, they helped and saved in the building. Exactly, it did. Yeah, if it if it just been open and vacant uh, completely, it probably wouldn't be uh, in the state it is. That being said, the building has had not a lot of care over the past 20 years. Uh, the roof has leaked tremendously, uh, so when we got the building, the first thing we did uh, was get a, a loose rubber roof put over the whole thing. It's just like a big rubber tarp with uh, batten strips to hold it down. That has stopped the uh, hemorrhaging 
uh, inside. We also put that metal shed roof on the bottom of the photo where there's a failing retaining wall. We could not afford any more water behind that retaining wall. It used to be a hill on that side of the building and then that was carved away in the 70s to create that parking lot. And probably would have been fine if the downspout and gutters had been maintained, but eventually all the water just piled up behind that uh, retaining wall and it failed. Um, so the building has been moving um, towards the north. So that's uh, temporary just to keep the water out of there. And of course, the, uh, in the corner of the building, a concrete block addition was, was added to create more storage space. I'll be the first one to swing the sledgehammer to get rid of that. Uh, so it has been you know, kind of stabilized. Uh, we also have been uh, taking out a number of uh, window openings. So if you look at the building, you think, oh, those are 30 by 50 inch windows up there. No, they're four by six feet each window, 58 on the second floor. Uh, so they do allow a tremendous amount of light in, but they will be a massive uh, windows to put back in just on the second floor. Some of the arched windows on the first floor are nine by 11 feet. So here's uh, that uh, telegraph or dispatch room on the west end that we saw earlier. So I'm just looking through three open windows and turning around looking uh, from west to east uh, throughout the upstairs. You can see it was obviously gutted. Um, it was built kind of free span. All of the joists, ceiling joists are, are clear span. And then in the middle of the building where it's wider, it has trusses that, uh, so all the office walls were infill walls. Of course, they were designed originally, but I think they did that so if they wanted to change the layout of the building, none of those walls were supporting walls and they could uh, do that, and we think that's what happened in the West End here. There are some floor areas where there are pieces of flooring patched in where there were walls. So perhaps when that telephone came to the building, they did some modification there. So there's enough uh, framing left that we've been able to, um, to document where these rooms were, where the doors were, um, and uh, with some of the information, we can pinpoint uh, certain rooms. And here's the first uh, ray of sunlight entering the men's waiting room after uh, probably about 45 years. Interestingly though, all of those south-facing windows were under the canopy, so this is kind of a false sense of what could be because they didn't have any direct sunlight uh, to begin with. Uh, here's the women's waiting room. You can see the tremendous amount of damage to the, the second floor system and the collapsed first floor. Uh, some ceiling woodwork is about all that remains in the building, although there is some wainscoting in the lunchroom. Um, and the staircase, by some miracle, is still intact and usable to the second floor with some repair and uh, that were made and to the basement. And that will provide, certainly, uh, replication. Um, we hopefully can use a lot of those spindles over, but the majority of it will have to be rebuilt and reconstructed. Uh, there's a partial basement under about a third of the building. Uh, underneath the lunchroom and kitchen is the, the biggest room, which was the boiler room. And um, a lot of dirt and material sifted through the two coal chute openings there um, over the years before those were finally uh, bricked up once and for all. And uh, that material was removed uh, this summer. And we'll have to do something with those large, large blobs of concrete that poured in until it stopped through those coal chutes, but in the far left there, you can see the, the one hallway that goes to the uh, room at the bottom of the stairs um, and, then, and then up. So not a lot of room in the basement, but enough for uh, coal and uh, the boiler. So right now the building is under a, a six month uh, historic structure report study. This is uh, uh, to document the history of the building, the changes to the building, its current conditions, also to provide schematic design ideas for the future use of the building, and um, uh, most importantly for us, cost estimates as to what uh, the building will take to bring back to life. So there's a couple of uh, images. This, the, these days they can laser scan the building, so they can get, you leave your uh, pencil laying there next to the building, it'll pick it up on the, the laser scan. Um, so very accurate, um, so we can know exactly what's going on with the building structurally and then you can get uh, use those to create uh, as is drawings and then future drawings as well. 
So uh, what, what is the building going to be? We're still kind of uh, hashing that out. There is a lot of building here to work with. Um, the men's and women's waiting rooms and the ticket office area will all be restored to what it used to look like so we can have presentations like this, our own presentations, uh, rentable space. Um, the lunchroom probably will become more or less the lobby to the building where uh, the elevator will be in the, kit the old kitchen area with the second set of stairs wrapping around it, going up to the second floor. And uh, the baggage and ex express room will be where the uh, handicap ramp is internally. The baggage and express room are 20 inches lower at platform height to the rest of the building, which had three steps to get up into those waiting rooms and the lunch room. So uh, that'll be an express room, a handicap ramp, and another bathroom. And the baggage room, we hope to have a model layout of the Baraboo uh, yard. Um, and of course, including this building. Um, and we have a couple of antique automobiles that we'd like to put in there as well. Second floor uh, could be exhibit space, which is what we're leaning towards now, um, and uh, some other storage space and, and offices as well. So that's what gives us inspiration, uh, seeing it come back to life as it was. Um, if you're interested uh, in progress, you can uh, visit our website, sawcountyhistory.org. Uh, you can sign up for our e-newsletter as well, twice monthly, which will often have uh, a depot update. So, all right, any questions? Yeah. Any asbestos issues? Yeah, there were, yeah, there were, there were some lead, uh, all the basement pipes were wrapped in asbestos. A lot of that in the, in the, the basement you can walk around in was gone already, thankfully, but in the, underneath the waiting rooms, that's all crawl space, and there's a lot of asbestos down there, so we'll have to deal with that. But that's, that's the least of our <laughs> problems, really. The structure of the building, we've, we've, we've gotten this just in time, because it, it wouldn't last much longer. Are you, go <clears throat> Are you going to uh, put a canopy back on it again? Yeah, definitely. We, we want to put the canopy back on. We would like to get it back from Circus World. They took the two freestanding ends of the canopy and stitched them together as one long pavilion to cover. Actually, the elephants were housed under the canopy originally back in the 60s. Um, but uh, so that'll be a, that'll be a discussion to have with them. They have six. We have those 24 cast iron posts for the canopy. Uh, seven have come back to us that were not used at Circus World. 16 are at Circus World, and we're missing one, which we think was left as a signal uh, device when the canopy was removed, although I guess there was freight still, so they needed some sort of signal device, and that one disappeared at some point, so we will either have to get that recast or uh, replicated in, in another material, but yeah, we want to get it back. So railroads sometimes, certain railroads insist that you have to put up a fence along the track, Right. And is that coming? Um, yeah, in fact, we have to get the land around the depot. The depot is 10, we have 10 feet on either end, and the lot line is on, the, on, the, on this side of the building, on the track side. So, as you may know, the DOT owns the dirt, the land itself. The Wisconsin Rail Transit Commission owns the track ties and ballast, and Wisconsin Southern Railroad leases the uh, line. All three of those parties have to agree and we're working with, uh, I think the Rail Transit Commission and the DOT are certainly agreeable to giving us the land we need. Uh, we just have to appease the railroad. We would like to get the siding track next to the building, move the switch further uh, east so that they can still use the uh, siding, but then that would give us uh, room to, to have some cars there as well as get the, you know, keep the, the traffic further, people further away from the active rail line, which is unfortunately further away. So. There'll either be a fence right at the canopy edge to, to keep people off both tracks or between the tracks uh, to keep them off the main line. So hopefully the latter. There, is there any heat or other facility, utilities in the building? Now? No, there's absolutely, the only thing in the building is some electrical. And we're running an old furnace fan up in the attic to, to bring the hot air down from under the roof. and into the basement, and then we got a giant barn fan blowing about eight hours a day to exhaust the basement, and it's, it's, it'll take months yet before the, the building is completely dry. It was, it was completely closed up, completely unventilated, and, and holes the size of people in the roof, so it was, it was just pouring through there. Fortunately, there's a floor drain in the basement that still worked, and 
know where it goes. I don't want to know where it goes, but it went somewhere else. And uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about this building at all. Half a block north. What, what's that? Half a block north, right into the river. Oh, yeah, I'm sure, exactly. So what is your timeline? Timeline, if somebody wants to write us an eight or $10 million check right now, it would probably still be two or three years before this was done. So it'll totally depend on, okay. on fundraising. What kind of shape does the exterior get in terms of like uh, well, it, and that Yeah, kind of they're, they're saying it'll have to be 100% repointed, and they're probably right. There's been some crappy jobs of repointing. There's, there's plenty of repointing that needs to be done, so it'll have to be repointed. But it's, it's four, or the bottom of the walls are five bricks wide. The majority of the wall is four bricks wide. All the in interior first floor walls are four bricks wide. So that's the only reason the building's standing is because it was so uh, substantial. But there's, there's a three inch crack inside the building if you aggregate all the cracks up. So um, it'll have to, it won't be brought back together, but it will be stabilized so it can't move any further. Uh, the architectural firm that's uh, heading up the HSR, the Historic Structure Report, is Caballo Oshatko out of Cedarburg, and they uh, we're on the job with the Garber Feed Mill in Madison, so if you know that building, it, it did not have any roof on most of it, and there were mature trees growing through the building, so they can save that. They can help us <laughs> save this. We have a sapling growing in the gutter. Um, interestingly, the wooden gutters were still on parts of the building um, from 1902, solid wood gutters. I don't think they were lined with metal. They were some species, maybe oiled or something, and they were held on with uh, about four inch slotted screws about the size of my pinky. So I, you know, they obviously pre-drilled a hole, but can you imagine screwing on a gutter when you have this much room inside the gutter to screw on a, a slotted screw? And they were still holding parts of the gutter on uh, after 118 years. So we, we save all that stuff. We found two pieces of slate. We found two bricks from the, the canopy platter, the depot platform down in the basement. So Few treasures. We found actually a timetable down in the basement and one of the thrown in one of the crawl spaces. So, few treasures in there yet. Any other questions? It's good. Yeah. Is it going to be on the National Register then? Yeah, actually, the the State Historical Society actually funded the National Register nomination. Um, that's been written. I believe it's going to come up in August here at the state level, and then it'll get forwarded to the National Park Service. We hope to do this as a historic preservation income tax credit project. Uh, just like the Albring the Theater did here in town. So even as a nonprofit, we don't pay income tax, but there's ways to sell that tax credit and reap some of those benefits. So hopefully we can get about 25% off the cost of this building. It costs $4 million, it would be $1 million less, or $1 million in cash. So pray for us, please, because <laughs> it's, it's a big undertaking.